What happens if we bring the sun to Earth? What would happen if you were to bring a tiny piece of the sun to Earth? Short answer, you'd die. Long answer, it depends which piece of the sun. Like most of the matter in the universe, our sun is neither solid, liquid, or gas, but plasma. I don't think I've done this video. Plasma is when stuff is so hot that the nuclei and electrons can separate and flow around freely, which creates a goo-like substance. So you can imagine our sun as an extremely big, spherical ocean of very hot goo. The deeper you go, the denser and weirder the goo becomes. So let's bring three samples, each the size of a house, to our lab here on Earth and see what happens. First sample, the chromosphere. The chromosphere is the atmosphere of the sun, a layer of sparse gas up to 5,000 kilometers deep that's covered in a forest of plasma spikes. This is the layer where we send the Parker probe, right? Or is there an even outer layer? So the Parker probe, the fastest space probe we've ever launched um, because it needed all that energy to get near that sun. How close did the Parker probe get to the sun? Doesn't sound close, but that's close. <laughs> outer atmosphere or corona okay so that's I, I did think it was different from the chromosphere that can be almost as big as earth it's pretty hot here between 6,000 and 20,000 degrees celsius but if we brought a sample of it to earth we're not really getting our money's worth in the area where we take our sample the chromosphere is over a million times less dense than air so compared to our atmosphere at sea level it's basically the same as bringing the vacuum of space down to earth the moment our sample arrives, it would immediately be crushed by Earth's atmospheric pressure and implode. Air would rush to fill the vacuum and use as much energy as 12 kilograms of TNT in the process. This creates a high-pressure shock wave which shatters glass, ruptures eardrums, and maybe some internal organs. If you're standing... Wow, this is uh, actually quite intense. <laughs> yeah. You'd assume it would approach some kind of equilibrium. Um thanks to things like thermodynamics and things like that. But I didn't expect all this duck bone breaking. How do we know the layers of the sun? Satellites? Oh, no, no, no. Basically, electromagnetic radiation. We, we just look at it, we observe the sun, also through visible light uh, and all types of light, right? And from that, we can decipher what it's made of, um, how big it is, how much gravity it has, um, all kinds of things. We can literally look at its surface in different types of light to see what's going on. We can we can uh, look at the sun in forms of light that you know you can peer into the deeper layers of it. Um, and then not only that, through computer simulations, which is a very good tool because then we can simulate what's going on inside, what's going on with the magnetic, you know, bubble of the sun, which we don't understand, how it's formed. We don't understand why it flips every 11 years. It's got all these weird dynamos on it. Getting too close, it could kill you. So you'd better keep your distance. Let's go deeper. A second sample, the photosphere. Beneath the chromosphere is the glowing surface of the sun, the photosphere, which produces the light we see. You should come check out the new thing I've created. The beta is out. The CalVPN beta is out. It's a post-quantum. Uh, VPN, which is a brand new kind of one, and it can literally protect you from quantum computers. So come get it. I built it. It's a lot of fun. It's covered in a grid of a million hotspots called granules, each of them about as big as the United States and over 5,000 degrees Celsius. These granules are the tops of convective columns, churning gas that brings the heat up from the center Dynamos. of the sun to its surface. In these columns, a few hundred kilometers down, we take our second plasma sample. It has about the same pressure as our atmosphere on Earth. So this is where you get the sun holes at the top. And uh, they're basically regions where there's intense uh, magnetism, but there's less heat and stuff like that. Uh, and then when you get solar flares, you have to kind of get two of them together. And uh, they, they the, the magnetic field lines basically connect and then they cause mayhem and break and... They spit out some uh, sun, sometimes the CMEs, coronal mass ejection. Uh, but solar flares can just sort of shoot off some radiation. Hello, everyone. Hello, Pony the heat up from the center of the sun to its surface. 
In these columns, a few hundred kilometers down, we take our second plasma sample. It has about the same pressure as our atmosphere on Earth. Though still much less dense than air, its heat supports it, so it won't implode. Our sphere now carries twice as much energy, as much as 25 kilograms of TNT, but this time as heat. For a dazzling instant, this plasma would glow with a million times the brightness of the sun seen from Earth, instantly lighting fires throughout our lab. But a few milliseconds later, those fires are all that's left. The plasma has cooled to harmless gas floating up from the flaming ruins. What if we go deeper? Third sample, the radiative zone. Here, the plasma is about 2 million degrees Celsius and so dense and tightly packed that it creates a sort of maze for itself. Great visuals. Energy in the form of photons tries to escape, but has to wander for hundreds of thousands of... What, can, what kind of idiot can be described as the most successful or helpful or useful? Um, one that's named Dylan. Jay Dance. ...years bouncing endlessly from particle to particle until it eventually finds an exit. Bringing matter from here to our lab is what experts call a very bad idea. <laughs> As soon as it arrives in our lab, the extreme pressure that holds the plasma tightly together is gone and the material explodes with the power of a thermonuclear weapon. Our lab, as well as the city around it, will be destroyed in an instant. On the bright side, there won't be any radioactive fallout. With our lab destroyed, we can abandon the illusion that we're trying to do any science today. So you could talk about fusion here a whole bunch because, you know, we're trying to reproduce, we're trying to do that, right, here on Earth. That's what's happening in the core of the sun. And it's why you've got a lot of interesting stuff happening. Uh, and basically, we want to do that because it allows you to have, you know, some a good source of energy that doesn't produce, you know, uh, radioactive waste. And so that would be nice to be able to do that. But the problem is it, it creates so much energy. Like, how do you contain it all? Well, they're trying to use giant magnets deep underground, IDA. Uh, and there's lots of other new interesting ways that physicists trying to you know get this to work on earth but for the you know the reasons that he's kind of talking about here some of this comes into it this is why it's so hard uh and he's just taking a chunk of the sun imagine taking i'm not sure if he's going to get to the core i think we're about to but bringing a piece of the core of the sun to earth is exactly why fusion is hard to ha you know do on earth what if we go much much deeper last sample the core here in the central 1% of the star, we find a third of the sun's mass. The matter here is compressed by the weight of the entire star above it. In the center of the core, the temperature is 15 million degrees, hot enough to make helium by smashing together hydrogen, powering the sun by nuclear fusion. In billions of years after the death of the sun, this core will remain as a white dwarf. If we brought a sample of it to Earth, it would cause a lot of... We just of did a white dwarf video, by the way. I don't know if we put it on the channel yet. ...inconvenience. The biggest nuclear weapon ever detonated had an energy of 40 megatons of TNT, or a cube the size of the Empire State Building. Our sample has the equivalent of 4,000 megatons. This is 4 billion tons of TNT, or a cube 1.3 kilometers high. There's like a billion... Uh, Zar bombers exploding in the sun uh, every every like second. <laughs> to give you a sense of scale, this is the cube. That's just on like the the Adelaide's as well. Cube inside Manhattan. Once the sphere arrives on Earth, this super dense matter expands instantly and creates an explosion with the force of, well, the sun. If we get the sample in Paris in the morning, the citizens of London would see what looks like a second sunrise, but one that gets brighter and brighter and hotter and hotter until London burns to ashes. In a radius of about 300 kilometers around the blast, everything would be burnt. I don't think that would, I think it would happen much quicker than that, right? This stuff would be traveling out at the speed of light. <laughs> the shock wave would travel around the earth multiple times. Most buildings in Central Europe would be flattened, eardrums would rupture, and windows break across the continent. The explosion would be apocalyptic, possibly human civilization ending. If humans did survive, we could count on the dust blown into the atmosphere to create a small ice age. So, if there is one tiny bright side, it would be that the explosion might be an effective way to control human-caused climate change for a few decades. While this is definitely a good thing, all in all, we conclude that we should not try to bring the sun to Earth. 
That's exactly what we're trying to do with Fusion, though. <laughs> now you know why it's so dangerous and so hard. Anyway, that was another cool video.